Praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to the telecast again this week. I'm Len Paxton, and it's a joy and a delight to come into your hearts, your lives, and your homes with the Word of Almighty God. Amen. There's nothing more powerful than this right here, the Word of Almighty God. Now today, I want you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to the 11th chapter of the book of Mark the 11th chapter of the book of Mark, and we're going to look at Jesus, we're going to look at a fig tree, we're going to look at mountain moving faith, hallelujah, and we're going to look at the key to mountain moving faith, which is also found in this very passage. So let's begin reading, please, uh, Mark chapter 11, and we'll start reading with verse 12. Today, I'm reading from the NIV. Here's what the Bible says. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. How many knows today that as a believer, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, the Lord expects out-of-season fruit from our lives? especially when we're advertising that we've got the goods. Amen? We, we, we advertise the name of Jesus. It says on our buildings, church. It says on our buildings, you know, uh, Pentecostal church or Baptist church or whatever we're advertising. This tree had the leaves, and when leaves were on the fig tree, there was supposed to be fruit there. I want you to think of that. But when Jesus reached this tree, even though it was out of season, he expected to find something to eat, and there was nothing. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now they, they were listening to this, taking it all in. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. Remember that. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. How many today are doing little more than merchandising the gospel? That's, a, that's basically all it is. Most preachers, not most, but many preachers, um, you know, they care about selling their book, their tape series, their DVD series. Uh, they're selling this and selling that and selling the other when the Bible calls us to freely give what we have freely received, and that is the message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and a dying and a hopeless hurting world in the hour in which you and I live. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong. Hold on before you tear your clothes and throw dirt in the air. I'm not saying that it's wrong to sell tapes and sell books and sell CDs and videos and DVDs and all this. It's not wrong to do it. But that should never become the primary thrust of your outreach. Your outreach needs to be about one thing, first and foremost, Jesus. Secondly, souls. Jesus first, souls second. Everything else lines up after that. And when I say that the outreach uh, is to be about souls, I'm meaning not just preaching the gospel to them, but we need to be feeding the hungry, uh, giving water to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting the prisoner, and of course, in the doing of those things, we're going to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. So, these are the priorities that Jesus is laying out here in this teaching. And remember now, the disciples are standing right there looking at this and listening to it. And they're getting these object lessons from the Lord, from what's going on here. He would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? Hallelujah. You know, we're changing the name. Uh, here at the ministry, we're, we're still going to be called Acts 26, 18 Ministries. We're still going to be called Cross Chapel, but we're adding to it Cross Chapel and Prayer Outreach Center. Because if there's anything that we need in this hour more than ever before, 
especially in America, but not, in, not limited to America. All over the world, God's people need to begin to cry out to Him and call out to Him in mighty waves of intercessory prayer, prophetic prayer, in the day that we're living in. Men and women have been calling for this for decades. And I believe that right now, by the power of Almighty God and by the Word of the Lord, it's time that we go into the fullness of this prayer movement. Ladies and gentlemen, it's critical to our survival. I hope you're understanding that. I hope you're hearing me. It's critical to our survival. We cannot make it without His touch. We cannot make it without His power. We cannot make it without His grace. We cannot make it without His love and His encouragement many times. And I find this to be true in our outreach work for Jesus. Many times, people are the last ones that want to encourage you. They're just not there. And even some who have said, oh, we're there, we're there, but they're really not. But let me tell you something. Oh, hallelujah, and oh, happy day. Jesus Christ never leaves your side. He said, he promised, and God is not a liar. Remember I told you a couple months ago, we're going to be emphasizing that a lot in 2013. God is not a liar, and he has promised. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always encourage you. I will lead you with the guidance of my eye, the Bible says. He just has to give a look sometimes. Praise God, and we know what that means, hallelujah, if we're being led by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has promised to be our encouragers. Glory be to God. What a powerful promise from the Lord, hallelujah. It says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. A den of robbers. Merchandising the gospel merchandising the people of God, merchandising the hearts of hurting humanity. And the chief priest and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you, if you didn't already know it, most of you probably are aware of it, but let me share with you, when you take a bold stand for truth, they're going to want to kill you, just like they did the master. Jesus said, you're not above him. You're not, the, the servant is not above the master. They wanted to kill him. They hated him. They're going to want to kill and hate you too. If you're determined to stand for what is true, what is right, what is noble, what is pure, what is holy in these last days. And I'm going to tell you one of the biggest things that we take, some of the most heat that we take in this ministry right here, is we have taken a stand against judgmental and critical spirited Christians. Christians who have to have it their way or the highway, and for my, for my dollar it can be the highway, because we're going to go the way of Jesus in this ministry and in all that we come in contact with. You know that we won't work with people who are bashing others in the body of Christ. I don't care. Even, you know, even if they are doing something wrong, there is a proper biblical way to approach a subject. If, if you're going to bash them, if you're going to criticize them, gossip about them, post it on Facebook, whatever you want to do, we're not going to work with you because we cannot afford to allow that to get into our spirit in these last days. Praise God. We need to be a holy people. We need to serve the Lord in purity and in obedience and we need to embrace. Sometimes a person can even be uh, doing something that's wrong. I'm not talking about gross sin. I'm not talking about something that's fantastically outrageous. I'm talking about just something we don't think it's right. But we're called to work with them anyway and not to criticize them for the sake of the kingdom. What is this all about to some of you anyway? Is this about, <laughs> hallelujah, is this about your kingdom or is this about his kingdom? Is this about your reputation or his great name? Hallelujah. And we got to determine that. We've got to determine that as we begin to teach, preach, and make disciples in these last days. And I'll work with anybody, even if they're doing some things that I think is wrong, even if they got some doctrines I don't agree with, I'll work with them as long as they don't have a judgmental, critical spirit. Okay? Critical spirit, judgmentalism will short-circuit your faith. 
And hallelujah, the Lord has instructed us. We need our faith to be top-notch every single day day beloved because we have a job to do we have a king to promote we have souls to win hallelujah by the power of the holy ghost and we want to have the right heart the right spirit the right attitude as we move out into that praise god whoo i don't know where all that came from but glory to god now it says here he said the uh, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him. See, people are afraid of you when you got truth. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. The whole crowd. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered. They saw the fig tree withered from its roots. Peter remembered what he'd seen and heard the day before. Hallelujah, Peter. And he said to Jesus, Rabbi, look! The fig tree you cursed has withered. I just want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that God cannot prosper and God cannot bless a false advertised Christian. Hallelujah. If you say you have Jesus in your heart, then live like you have Jesus in your heart. If you say you've got the Holy Ghost, then live like you got the Holy Ghost. If you say that you believe in miracles and healing and prosperity, then live like it. If you say you believe in holiness, bless God, then let's let the Lord's blood make us holy. Hallelujah. If you say, if you advertise, be a possessor of the things you are professing. This is of paramount importance to the Lord in the last days. And he said, the fig tree you cursed is withered. God is going to uproot and throw down churches that are false advertising that they have the power of God, but really they're dead. And they're dried up like last year's bird's nest, and they have no... They have no dynamic power of the Holy Spirit in them at all. It's a social club. It's a social gathering. You might as well just go out and be a Kiwanis. Nothing wrong with being a Kiwanis, but you might as well just be that and not fool with going to a church that's dead and dry and boring. Our churches need to be on fire for the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit and for the Lord Jesus Christ in these last days. We need to, we need to possess what we profess in the day and age in which you and I, dear friend, are living. Have, now here's what Jesus said in response to what Peter had said. Have faith in God. And in the original it says, have the God kind of faith. Jesus answered, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Now we've got to believe that we receive. Faith can move the mountain. We have to believe that we receive. Okay? And here's the thing. The fig tree wasn't doing that. It was saying, here's my leaves. The fig tree was actually saying, in essence, to Jesus, Hey, hungry Jesus, look at my leaves. I got something for you to eat over here. But then when Jesus got there, there was no fruit. It had leaves, but no fruit. Just like, what did Adam, uh, Adam and Eve make their coats with when they sinned and fell from God's grace and God's love and God's mercy in the Garden of Eden back in the very beginning? What did they make their covering with? Fig leaves. There's those fig leaves again. No fruit, no walk with God, no power of God, disobedient hearts and spirits, critical judgmental individuals who made a judgment and who make judgments other than those God has made, but yet, but yet, oh my, we're going to cover it up with what looks like the real deal. Fig leaves, but we got no fruit. God said that wasn't sufficient. You know, he had to make them animal skin, showing them that the way back to relationship with himself was through blood, through the sacrifice of an innocent victim. And of course we know the story that Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for all of us who will believe and who will receive. So we believe, let me, let me change it, let me put this first. We speak 
We believe, we receive. Hallelujah. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now here we come. What we've seen so far is faith that can move a mountain. We've seen an unproductive, false advertised fig tree. That's faith in reverse. That's the fruitlessness of faith. Your faith will do you no good if you're not committed to being solid with Jesus Christ. I mean solid. I don't mean holding on to your favorite sin and everything else might be okay. You need to be solid with Jesus. Walk with the Lord on a daily basis. Walk with the Lord closer than you've ever walked with Him. Secondly then, we see the principle that faith in God, the faith of God, can move the mountains in our life. Sometimes those mountains are, are external, but often those mountains are internal within us. Sometimes the biggest mountain that needs to be removed is what we're going to read about now. And here's what it says. It says, and when you stand praying, <clears throat> if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So we can see that sometimes the greatest mountain, that mountain moving faith needs to remove, is that mountain within us of unforgiveness toward anyone who has done us wrong in any capacity. And if we don't have that forgiveness in place, it will do us little good to pray because there will be no answer forthcoming from the Lord until we deal with that mountain. And that mountain is speak, believe, receive. We've come through the blood. We've come through the power of the cross. Hallelujah. We speak. I choose to go God's way. The promises of His Word. The, the Holy Word of God tells me to be a forgiver. The Holy Word of God tells me to be a lover of men's souls. And so I speak that that is what I am. I choose that direction for my life. I will, I will quote the promises of God. I'll do whatever helps me in the realm of walking this out. We believe then and then we receive. And this is what Jesus laid down for us. No forgiveness, no true faith. I want to say that again. No forgiveness, no true faith. Faith will produce fruit, not just leaves in our life. And we want to have faith. We need to have faith. And biblically, beloved, the scripture's clear. We must have faith. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I cannot even please the God that I claim to love if I don't have proper faith in my heart and life and flowing out from me. So what do I have to be? I have to first of all understand that part of this principle is as a Christian, I need to go and lay my life on the altar of sacrifice as well. You see, we talk about the cross of Christ a lot, and Jesus you know, that's the most important message of the, of the church, ladies and gentlemen, the cross of Christ. It was there he paid for our redemption, total, totally, completely, 100%. But also, also, he said, take up your cross daily and follow after me. What does that mean? That refers to the fact that sometimes we may not want to forgive. Sometimes we may not want to love others. Sometimes we may not want to conduct ourselves properly according to the word, the will, and the wisdom of God that he has laid out for us in the Bible. And sometimes we just want to do what we want to do. But we can't afford to live that way because that will produce a corrupted effect of the, all the promises in our life. Sometimes I've actually seen promises work in reverse for people. Blessings become curses because they have not obeyed the Lord. So... We've got Jesus' cross, that's, and that's the most important. We've got our cross that we need to take, and we need to allow the Lord, through the power of faith, to remove those mountains from our hearts and life. Sometimes it's remove them one by one. Sometimes it takes years to get through to this. But forgiveness is the key. I want to say it again, because that's an issue that every one of us will face at one time or another. Forgiveness is the key the key, the definite key to mountain-moving faith. 
I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, in these last days, we can take faith in Jesus Christ and absolutely see people's hearts and lives change by the power of God for time and eternity. That's my passion. That's my heartbeat. That's why I'm here, to see people change by the power of God. We can do that, but we have to have that faith working and operating within us all the time. And the way to have that is to make sure, I, I posted something on one of my sites the other day, and it goes like this. We're living in, in the last of the last days, I believe, and we're coming to a time where we need to keep short accounts with people and with God. Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you just become whatever somebody wants you to be. You be who God made you to be, hallelujah. But we do have to let stuff roll off of us, and we do not want to be guilty of taking offense and, and harboring unforgiveness against those who don't understand us, don't even care to, don't want to, don't like us, don't love us, whatever. You know, all that may be true, but we have to learn to harness, harness our emotions in these last days by the power of the Word, and we have to walk in faith, reaching out to other people in the name of Jesus Christ. And sometimes when you reach out, you will get slapped. Sometimes, you, you know, when you're running down the, the, the path of life that God has for you, somebody's going to try to trip you. It's going to happen. These type of things, Jesus said, offenses will come. He said, woe be to the ones who are causing the offenses. But here's what we got to do. We got to love them. We got to forgive them. Forgiveness is the key to mountain moving faith in your life. Forgiveness is the key to mountain moving faith in my life, and I've got to have it. I've got some mountains that we need to blast out of the way and go forward in Jesus' mighty name in the last days that we're living in. So forgiveness is an absolute key to the miracle working power of God. I believe we're going to see a resurgence of miracle evangelism in these final hours. Hallelujah. We're believing for the sick to be healed, for the dead to be raised, for nations to be changed, for mighty miracles where the food supply is concerned. I'm believing for just tremendous miracle evangelism to come into a resurgence in these last days. And so we've got to get this down pat. We've got to get our interpersonal relationships correct. We've got to stop taking offense. We've got to stop putting others on a pedestal and holding them to such a high, high thing that they can't even hope to keep it. And they got to walk on eggshells and all of this type of foolishness. We've got to grow up in the body of Christ. And we've got to move forward in the power of faith in these last days. And beloved, I have to say it one more time. I have to tell, to tell it because God's put this word in my heart. Forgiveness is the key to mountain moving faith. I mean, it is directly linked to it. Let's read it again here from the Word of God. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if someone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer... Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Hallelujah. You want victory over that sin? Ask Him for it. Believe you receive, and that victory will be yours. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. How much plainer do we want the Lord to make it? Oh, I know, we can sit and we can come up with all of our qualifications for this passage. But I, let's just take Jesus at his word today, shall we? I think that's the best motive to have any time. Now, yes, we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we come to an understanding that we, we just can't ask for any old thing that we might want if it's not in the will of God. But I'm going to tell you right now, loving your neighbor is in the will of God. Health and wholeness for your body is in the will of God. Forgiving other people is in the will of God. You having enough to make ends meet is in the will of God. All of these things that are clearly outlined in the Scripture is the will of God. I never have to pray, Lord, what is your will in a situation if I've got a clear word on it? 
Now, I have to pray about everything when it's not directly uh, covered in the Bible. But there are so many things that we'll face even on a daily basis in life that are covered in the Word of God. And half the time we act like we don't believe it. There's no sense in praying. If, if God has said, go ye into all the world, I don't have to pray about it. I just have to pray about how I fit into it. You see what I'm saying? So these are the type of things. We need this undaunted faith. Hallelujah. And, and when you stand praying, when, you, when you're in that posture, you're ready to do business with God. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So we see two things about forgiveness here this week as we close this telecast. Number one, we see that forgiveness is directly linked to mountain-moving faith. And number two, we see that if you won't forgive others, God will not forgive you. And let's say that even another way for more clarity. If you, if you won't forgive others, God can't forgive you. It's just His justice system, folks. So forgiveness is the all-important key. And when we come back next week, we're going to talk about the subject. Um, I, believe, I believe we'll talk about the subject, how do I know if I've truly forgiven someone? And you don't want to miss it. Thanks for joining us this week. It's been a joy and a delight, as always, to have you with us as we study the Word of God together. This is Brother Paxton saying, Go with God, and He will go with you. Bless you now is my extreme prayer for your life. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all.